Hello, hello, what is going on guys? It is I, Daltry, and we are here with a very normal Radiant Dawn playthrough. Yup, no need to check the description, don't read any of the comments, don't do any of that. This is a completely typical Radiant Dawn LTC playthrough. Real quick, before we actually start, I just want to say this is not going to be like a, a typical thing. This is just going to be done when there is time. And today just happened to be one of those times. Honestly, it was going to be a three hours video today, but the thing is... Those have about a 24 hour editing cycle between rendering, editing the video, and uploading it, and uh, just so happened that it decided to fail. So instead of nothing today, this is what you get instead. <laughs> so we're just gonna jump right into chapter one. Like I say, this is a completely normal playthrough. I was just checking out those bandits there on the right hand side to see what their attack speeds were. We do want them to have an attack speed of eight in this case because that's gonna allow Edward to get the double attack on those guys. Speaking of Edward, we got two units right off the bat. So we have Edward and we have Micaiah. Now, Edward is actually pretty good for this early part of the game. He's able to double a lot of these, if not all of these bandits on this map. Like I say, I was specifically checking the two on the right-hand side of the map because sometimes they can roll nine speed. We need at least one of them to roll eight speed if this is going to work out. But like I say, Edward is pretty solid in the earliest parts of the game. He has access to the Wrath ability for free, which can be a nice boost to his damage. We will be taking advantage of that on this map as well. Uh, ordinarily, I'd say he has some pretty solid gross on top of that. Uh, we'll see if that really matters or not. Something tells me it probably will not. Now, Micaiah, on the other hand, she is normally a very high magic, very low speed, very frail type character. Uh, most of her utility typically comes from her ability to heal, at least in terms of the late game. Uh, however, for right now, she has access to two range chip damage that hits Rez, which is a very good boon for her, considering that Rez is typically the lower defensive stat. Uh, in Radiant Zone, it's not really as big of a deal as you might think. Mages are typically pretty slow, not strong enough to make up for the uh, higher levels of power that the enemies tend to have. Right now, though, the chip is absolutely valuable, and we'll be making use of her for that. As you can see, we're just kind of plowing through this first wave of bandits. There's nothing particularly special going on. We did make sure to trade Micaiah's herb over to Edward because he needs that if he's going to be able to manipulate his health here, as he does. We are taking this a little bit safer than what is actually mandatory. We could risk wrath rolls here, and that might help us save a turn or so in the long term. However, it's just a matter of reliability, honestly. We want to make sure that the things that we're doing are repeatable more or less don't get me wrong that's like totally arbitrary and I'll probably go back on that at least once <laughs> truthfully I think it's gonna come down to whether or not I feel like resetting for a strategy or not honestly because I can think of at least a few that are like kind of cool but at the same time maybe not the most reliable thing this is one of those cases though that I say hey we just roll with what works honestly and as is we only need to get two wrath crits throughout this entire map uh, at this point, you can see why we needed to ensure that these bandits have 8 speed or less because that will allow Edward to get the double attack. He actually ends up blowing the first one away. That's not really what's supposed to happen. Typically, what you would expect here is for the first bandit to attack Edward, get hit. Edward would get hit as well. Then Edward would preferably wrath crit the second bandit at least one time. We need that in order for us to get the best possible clear here. It doesn't really matter if we end up killing both of those bandits on this turn. Uh, for whatever reason, the boss moves last and the AI isn't capable of recognizing that. So instead of doubling up on Edward, they will instead choose to attack Leonardo. So even if Edward didn't go beast mode and get a double crit on that guy without even proccing wrath, it wouldn't matter. We'd still be okay in this scenario. Now, Edward does actually miss. However, because we got that little bit of luck earlier where he managed to kill a bandit all by himself, it does not matter. We can use Mikai and Leonardo in this case to get the chip damage on the boss that we need to take him out of our hair, which is exactly what we're going to do. Mikai is going to get a level up here, and uh, she's going to match Edward, one stat only. Hmm, how strange. <laughs> okay, dropping the facade for a little bit. So this is a 0% gross playthrough, and the thing about that in terms of Radiant Dawn, right, is that the growths and leveling system works a little bit weird. It's actually impossible for you to get no stats upon level up if you have nothing capped. Goodbye, by the way. Edward's gonna put that guy down. Now, we did need to get one Wrath Quit on him over the course of two attacks in order for this to work out. So, you gotta figure his natural crit plus the 50% from Wrath, pretty likely. As I was saying, though, 
the way that the uh, level ups work in this game is pretty strange. You can't actually get no stats if you have zero cap stats, even if you have 0% in every single growth rate. So what I ended up doing was giving each character 100% in one dump stat. Uh, for mages, that's typically strength or luck. It should have just been strength all around, honestly, uh, because they don't actually benefit from that in any way. I was kind of thinking that weapon weight might might have been a factor, but it turns out that it wasn't. Uh, and for melee characters, we chose magic for the dump stack. So, yes, characters are technically leveling up one point at a time, but it's not going to matter, essentially. Bonus experience works in a similar way where you automatically get three points no matter what, even if you have 0% in that stat. So, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more later once we unlock bonus experience, but just know that we're not allowed to level up using that because of that three stat rule. Now, moving on to chapter one here. We move Nolan in such a way to get as much damage as we possibly can on these guys on the first enemy phase. We moved Edward in as well so that he can get some damage as well as build up his sword rank. I think we just got C rank for him, which is going to allow him to use the steel sword that we get on this map. Now, he does get a, another crit somehow, and possibly this guy's on fire today. But it doesn't matter because Leonardo and Mikai are both right there, and they can take out that first fighter that attacked Edward, uh, provided that he has 24 HP, which he does in this case. So we can still use Edward's turn for healing. We're going to do the same for Nolan, and Mikai is just going to chill because Edward is on fire. This kid is unstoppable, good lord. So this is our first escape map, and all we really need to do here is move Mikai up to the yellow point up there north where the boss Isaiah is. He also drops a steel sword as I say, so we wanna make sure that we kill him and not the fighter on the right hand side. Now while we're clearing out this choke point, let's just go ahead and touch on Nolan and Leo real quick. So Nolan, right? He's an obvious fan favorite. Lots of people love this guy. Uh, pretty tanky, comes at a high level. Typically pretty strong in terms of growth playthrough. And it's probably one of the only Dawn Brigade members worth investing in long term. Even then, it's still kind of debatable as to how useful he really is in the long term. But that said, he, there's still no denying that he's one of the better units that the Dawn Brigade has. Easily, easily. And in terms of this playthrough, that's still 100% the case. He's probably one of the best Bjork units that we have at our disposal. Right now, he's easily the hard carry. Easily the hard carry. High damage. Isn't getting doubled by too much and fairly durable as well. We also picked up Leonardo, and honestly, in the context of this playthrough, I think he's okay as far as the Dawn Brigade goes. Not great or anything, but honestly, the Dawn Brigade is gonna be strapped for useful characters, more so than usual, even. So the fact that he has, again, two range chip, fairly accurate in that regard, especially compared to some of the other options that we will have. On top of getting a really kick-ass personal weapon later on in the game, that's going to help him out quite a bit. Still not an amazing unit or anything, but despite that and his otherwise pathetic stats, he'll still be seeing some use. For example, he makes the perfect errand boy in this situation able to pick up Nolan's hand axe. Now, we did move Nolan into that choke point that the archer moved towards in order to block off Micaiah. She doesn't actually get one shot by the archer, believe it or not. I know, crazy. Rare footage of Micaiah surviving anything. And we need to move her there so that she can actually chip down that fighter so that Nolan can kill on the following turn, as he does. Now, we're actually just going to move Edward in this guy's face and use a herb. There's actually no real need to do this, but shoot, man, why not? Honestly, we're just about done with this map at this point, so all we really need to do is hand off the hand axe over to Nolan. He doesn't need it urgently or anything, and there's going to be more opportunities to get it over to him by the time he does, but this is the easiest chance we've got. There's no battle preps at this point, so any kind of item manipulation we need to do has to be done on the map itself. So we want to take the opportunities to do that while we can. Now, as far as the boss is, I, he's not really too much of a problem. Leonardo plus Nolan together can perfectly combine to KO him, and he will drop the Steel Sword. So we want to make sure that we're getting that kill with Nolan himself. That'll also bring him up to level 10, so we don't need to worry about his experience at this point. Of course, Nolan being as useful as he is, he'd still get to level 10 regardless of getting this boss kill, but we can do it here, and this will allow us to give the Steel Sword over to Edward right now as well. On top of that, Edward can escape on this map himself, which isn't necessary for completion. However, it does give a marginal amount of bonus experience. Nothing worth writing home about or anything, especially with the large experience penalty, uh, or rather large bonus experience penalty that you receive on hard mode. However, we're going to just take it for the hell of it. Honestly, no particular reason. We can, so we may as well. 
So what we're gonna do is I say we're gonna take the steel sword right now and have Edward escape. Makaya will soon follow and that's gonna be this map complete in six turns. There was also one more village in the bottom left hand corner of the map, but it's honestly so irrelevant. It's just a vulnerary. We don't need that. Even in even in terms of this playthrough, we don't need the we don't need the extra healing, essentially. It doesn't do anything for us and it just costs time. Now, there is a hard time limit on that previous chapter as well, so even in a more casual playthrough, you do have to be somewhat quick with your moves. Moving right along to chapter 2, this one is considerably more difficult than the previous two. Uh, believe it or not, already you may start noticing the 0% growth kicking in on some of these units. For example, Nolan is going to engage a fighter here on the second turn. In this playthrough, he doesn't actually get double attacked, however, there is the chance that he can and that wouldn't necessarily happen if you had Gross active at this point. So we're going to take Makai, we're going to shove her a little bit with Leonardo. We don't need him immediately in this chapter, and by shoving her in the way that we have, she's actually able to climb the ledge and immediately attack that fighter. In combination with Nolan, she's able to take him out. Uh, I do believe that there are some rolls where that's not possible, like some stat rolls if the fighter gets too much HP or too much defense, or a combination of both, it may not be possible. Uh, speaking of stat rolls on the enemies, you did see me check those two soldiers at the beginning of the map and we're doing so to make sure that Edward can actually survive the situation right here because he makes the best distraction in this case. Uh, he did get to C rank sword so he can use that steel sword here. He's not getting doubled or anything, which is a consideration honestly. The steel sword does weigh him down a fair bit, but these soldiers are still too slow regardless. So Edward's going to play around with his new friends down there in the corner for a little bit as Nolan is able to draw away this fighter. Now again, he does have the potential to double attack Nolan, which is why we're going for a sacrifice right here, and then we can follow that up with a heal from Laura onto Makai. Now we do need to move Laura here pretty quickly as well. This is yet another different map objective. We're not trying to route the enemy or escape. In this case, we are trying to have Laura arrive to the glowing blue tile at the north end of the map. It could be a little bit difficult though for these scrubs, so hopefully we'll be able to get some kind of help here. Uh, speaking of Laura though, she's... Alright, I guess she's just a typical healer, nothing particularly special. She will eventually get access to the physics staff. And just because it amuses me so, we're gonna be We're gonna leave a special job to her, let's say. Even in the terms of a zero percent growth playthrough, she's capable of doing it, but she will need some help, of course. We'll see that when we see that though. We're talking way, way later in the game now. As for right now, here is so. Now so is a baller. This guy is probably the only reason that Act 1 is even remotely possible. Now, I know that there are technically some better characters that will be joining us uh, later on, but good god, this guy makes everything so much easier just by existing. Uh, real quick before we finish on him, we just need to deal with this fighter here. Now, unfortunately, the way the biorhythm works out, uh, he's going to be sort of a pain to hit. I do actually end up using Edward for that because he was able to deal with those two soldiers in time for this to be a viable move. It's not always going to be the case. Typically, he will kill at least one by this point, but it's not guaranteed. Uh, failing that, we do have to use Nolan, which, as we'll see in a second, would have been the smarter decision anyways, just because, again, that dang viral the mechanic. Uh, but I digress. We're getting a little bit sidetracked here. I was talking about Silk. This guy is a monster. You see all those enemies up in the north? You see all those guys, those five, six guys? Yeah, give him like a turn and we'll see how that goes. Here comes number one. <laughs> but yeah, this he he's just so good. He has high strength, high speed. He's able to one round KO most, if not all the enemies on this map. Uh, in fact, he can one round KO everything on this map that isn't the boss. Uh, for the soldiers, he does need to use his slightly stronger knife, the card. But for the archers, he can even do it with a simple bronze knife. And his ability to KO enemies doesn't really go away for Act 1 anytime soon. We'll soon have access to the forge, which is going to keep him relevant, despite the fact that he's not going to be getting any kind of stat gain from his levels or anything like that. Uh, of course, he does still suffer from the problem where he will fall off eventually, but there's no denying, especially uh, through the, the lens of this playthrough, that Soth is one of the best units in the game, hands down. The Dawn Brigade already has it super rough, and for them to give you such a clutch character like this is absolutely indispensable in terms of clearing the game quickly and efficiently. Now here's where I say I sort of messed up a little bit, because had I killed the uh, the fighter on the previous turn with Nolan, right, I would have drawn 
the soldier in the northwestern room that was on the right hand side as opposed to drawing the soldier in the northwestern room that was on the left hand side and again biorhythm is a factor the guy on the left hand side as you saw had best possible biorhythm which made our hit rates pretty sketchy right there and it's fortunate that we were actually able to take him out obviously that would have been a little bit better had we not drawn that soldier in particular and just simply left him to soth Fortunately, I am lucky, so none of that really matters. <laughs> We're able to take him out regardless. And honestly, the strategy doesn't really change. We still need to push Laura forward as soon as possible. It's just that... It's just that it's one of those mechanics, man. I almost never think of Biorhythm, and it comes to bite me in the ass. Now, it is technically possible to win on this turn by shoving Laura five times, which would allow her to access the escape point. But... We do actually want to get the treasure on this map. There's an energy drop in the upper right hand corner, which we are sending so towards as we speak. And there's also these two treasure chests in the bottom left as well. Now, we did ship this javelin guy on the previous turn by using Makai and then shoving her out of the way so that on this turn, Leonardo would be able to head down the ledge as well. Blocked off by Edward, of course, so that the Myrmidon in that room is not able to take him out. We do need to get these chests though because one of them contains the Thani, a super effective spell that allows Makai to deal extra damage to Cavaliers and Armor Knights. Now we're going to need that damage in particular for some of the maps coming up, uh, particularly on the very next map in fact, we'll be making use of that. And the only way to get it is by delaying a turn essentially because we can't push Laura far enough as well as deal with this room and do all the trades necessary in order to pass the key around such that we're able to get the correct treasure chest. Now, I do actually end up picking up both chests. I don't think that in the strictest sense it is necessary. However, it does keep us from needing to spend the money on a wind edge at some point. So, I figure just grab it right now. There's really no reason not to. The only thing lost really would be a one-use chest key. So, we can pick up the wind edge with Nolan and we can pick up the Thani with Leonardo right now. Laura is in range, so all we need to do is grab this last chest with Soth, the energy drop. Again, we do want to get that. It's going to be very useful. It's one of the only ways we have to boost our stats outside of promotion after all. So just like that, Chapter 2 is done in six turns. Not too bad, not too bad. It's going to get a little bit rougher going forward. Let me just tell you right now, this is the easiest the Dawn Brigade is ever going to have it, honestly. Act 3 is, whoa, man, something else. But I guess we're going to see that when we see that. Anyways, that's going to wrap up this part. We got those three chapters out of the way. Like I said, I'm not really sure when the next time I'll put one of these up will be. It's just going to happen when it happens, honestly. Either way, hopefully this was entertaining for you guys. There's a lot of stuff I actually do like about Radiant Dawn, especially in terms of a no gross playthrough. There's a lot of really interesting things about this game that don't really apply to some of the other games in the series. So I, I had a lot of fun playing this on 0%, and hopefully you guys will have some fun watching this as well. If you did enjoy, you know what to do. Leave a like, let me know your thoughts as well. I'm not sure if anybody else really has any experience with Radiant Dawn 0%, because it's kind of like... Honestly, I think it's kind of a pain to set up, but I had fun with it, so there's always that. Anyways, I will catch you guys on the next one. See you then. Peace.